morning, everyone. My name is Julie, and I'll be reading from the scriptures Genesis 1 and 2 today. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, Let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear, and it was so. God called the dry ground land. And the gathered waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let, and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems and that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in number and fill the water in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the produce... Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that move along the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind, and it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, 
because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of, no of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good, aromatic resin, and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihan. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Usher, and the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. For he was taken out of man, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. That is the word of the Lord. Julie, for reading that so well for us. Um, we've got to keep going, right? A few more pages left in this book. We'll get there. Um, kia ora everyone, my name's Dave, and it's so great to have you with us as we dig uh, into uh, sort of focusing on these two chapters that we've read. Um, uh, and, and as we kick into this new series, this series about rescue, uh, this epic promise that unfolds throughout the whole of the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation. Um, uh, we've called it rescue because, well, rescue is the central theme. Uh, it's, it's a theme that starts unfolding from, we'll, we'll pick it up more um, clearly next week as we dip into Genesis 3. But rescue is really, if there's one theme that binds the Bible together, um, then rescue is a pretty good one. Um, if you're wondering where I've got the ideas from, I've stolen most of them, I mean researched most of them, out of this book here, God's Big Picture. Um, I have two copies of this. If you are wanting to read along and dig in a little bit more, um, then they're about, I think they're $21 each. Um, I'll hook you up. Come and see me. Um, the other thing is our life groups will be working through this stuff as well. And so if you're not in a life group, now would be a great time to jump in and join one. We've got a couple of groups that have some space uh, and we're looking to start some more uh, either later this term or next term. Um, and so have a think about maybe joining um, a life group uh, and, and kind of working through as well, digging into this same part of God's word. Um, uh, the other thing I just want to 
draw attention to. Did you notice our flash new? Wow. So good. Steph's been kind of brushing this stuff up. Still a little bit of uh, a few changes to make. And if you notice any mistakes, it's because I had my hands on it at some point. Um, but uh, in here, you'll also find uh, a place to do sermon notes um, and a few other notices and things going on in the life of church. Um, so do uh, keep the Bible that we've just read open um, and let's pray together. Me karakia tato before we dig into these words. Our Father, we thank you so much that you are the God who speaks, the God who said, let there be light, and there was, and it was good. And, and yet you also speak to us through your word, the Bible, as you, uh, and by your wairua tapu, your Holy Spirit. You tell us about yourself, you tell us about your son, Jesus. You tell us about the rescue only he offers. And so would you guide us as we work our way through this part of your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. This book, this book, the Bible, somewhere between five and seven billion copies have been sold. Five billion. That's a lot. Uh, I had a quick count at home. I've contributed to this. We have about eight copies on the bookshelf. Um, there's this one that lives on my desk here. Uh, and then because I'm a geek, I have a couple of Hebrew and Greek ones scattered around that I know little bits of how to read. Um, I know what you're thinking. Dave Giesbers, Life of the Party, cracking out some Greek and Hebrew that no one understands. Then there's a handful of children's Bibles. Um, I think I'm pulling my weight a little bit. I'm keeping the Bible printing industry going. Uh, you possibly have one or two copies at home. Even, even if this is the first time you've walked into a church today, it's highly likely that somewhere sitting on a shelf, there is a copy of the Bible. And yet, what do we make of this book? You know, as a, as a whole, from cover to cover, not just kind of dipping in and going, um, there's a verse... So I've, is it in Isaiah? My motto to live by. Woe to him who wakes early in the morning. Um, but what do we make from cover to cover? There's some verses that follow after that make a whole lot more sense. Something about seeking after strong drink. But what do we make of the Bible from cover to cover? What do we make of the whole story across its whole, its two testaments? It's 66 books written by 40-something authors over a span of roughly 2,000 years, largely in the two languages of the time uh, for the people that wrote them down, Hebrew and Greek, a little bit of Aramaic scattered here and there. But the Bible that we have in our hands today or on our phones, it's a single book with a single subject. It's a subject we're going to spend the next eight weeks together exploring the rescue that God is mounting in Jesus. And this rescue, it's the epic promise that unfolds over the whole of the Bible. Look with me at Luke uh, chapter 24. It'll come up on the screen. Luke 24, verse 13. Now that same day, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. A and as they're walking down this road, Jesus joins them. Uh, verse 25, he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Verse 27, and beginning with Moses, that's the first book of Moses, Genesis, what we've just read. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures, the whole of the Old Testament, concerning himself. You see, the single book, it has a single subject, but it also has a single author. It, the ultimate author, God himself. Yes, written down by humans. Or, 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 and each book bearing their kind of particular styles and personalities as you read them. But recording exactly what God wanted them to say to us. 2 Timothy chapter 3, it's on the screen. This is the Apostle Paul. He's writing to Timothy, this young pastor, and to us today. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And so over the next eight weeks, as we survey this rescue that 
God is mounting in Jesus. The epic promise of the whole Bible, well, it starts at the beginning on page 1 in Genesis 1. Let's read that beginning together. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, this is just seven words in the original, but quickly, this idyllic garden scene, it's replaced by calamity in Genesis 3. It's the devil, that snake, he leads humanity to reject God and to reject the life that only God can offer. And yet as, this, as humanity faces judgment, there is hope. You see, there's the beginning of a promise in chapter 3, verse 15, as judgment is handed out, there's hope. One of Adam and Eve's offspring, he will crush the head of this serpent. The serpent will strike his heel. This promise of hope, this promise of rescue, it shapes then the rest of the storyline of the Bible. Because what we ought to do, having seen this promise, is to ask, who is it? Who is this one who will crush the serpent? who will deal with sin and evil. And so as the storyline of the Bible unfolds in Genesis 12, we we see this promise handed to Abraham to bless all people through him, all the peoples of the earth. And it continues and progresses in 2 Samuel 7. God makes a promise to one of Abraham's descendants, a king. His name is David. That promise that from him, will come an eternal king. But even then, even as God's kind of people go downhill, as they reject God over them, God promises through his prophets that he will give them a new heart so that they can actually love him. And then in the opening pages of the Gospels, it's all fulfilled in Jesus. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 the beginning of the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. You see, Jesus is the king who dies on a cross to rescue his people. But then the the Bible keeps going, doesn't it? And in 2 Corinthians 4, we see that Jesus, he is the king that now we, who are his people, proclaim as we wait for his return. And with that, The end of everything broken, the great city of the new creation, the new heaven. This is God's rescue. This is the unfolding promise. Now, we're going to spend a week on each of those. Uh, We're going to keep kind of remembering where they fit in the jigsaw puzzle. But today, we start at the beginning. And what we'll see as we start at the beginning is the pattern, the pattern of God's creation in Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1 again. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Straight on the first page, in the first verse, we're introduced to an infinite and amazing God, aren't we? This God who was before the beginning. This God who creates the heavens and the earth. Uh, You probably know that a creation story is not... It's not a kind of distinctly Christian thing. The, the Babylonians had Enuma Elish uh, Māori here in Aotearoa talked of separating Ranginui and Papatuanuku, their children, the gods of the natural world. Well, there's something t- human about wondering about our origins, isn't there? But, but this beginning here in Genesis, it's remarkably different remarkably different because here God creates everything from nothing he he simply speaks and creation happens did you see Genesis 1 verse 3 and God said let there be light four words let there be light and there was light God saw that the light was good okay can we just can we just pause for a second You see, see, before God spoke, there was nothing. Let there be light. 
That's all it took. That's all that God said. And there was light. Isn't that amazing? Let there be light. And God, then he separates this light from the darkness in verse 4. He names them. You know, just like we name a child, maybe. A mark of love, of care, of authority, of responsibility. Verse 5. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And that's the first day done. And there was evening and there was morning, the first day. This is the pattern of creation, the pattern that we see uh, unfolding throughout the, the rest of Genesis 1. Over the six days of creation, we get this pattern. And God said, let there be. Okay, verse 6, let there be a vault between the waters. At verse 9, let the water under the sea be gathered together. Verse 11, let the land produce vegetation. Verse 14, let there be lights. Verse 20, let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly. Verse 24, let the land produce living creatures. And, and, and after each of these let there be's, the, there's a simple affirmation, a simple affirmation that God is more than up to the task, more than able to do all of this. It was so. This echo, verse 7, 9, 11, 15, and 24. Let there be, it was so. Because what God says, it is. In this pattern, in God's creation, there's more to it. Did you notice? Did you notice how the days develop? You know, the first three, the first three days, spaces are made. The, the heavens, sea and sky, the, the dry ground. But then these kind of these spaces, you know, they're filled in. The sun, moon and stars fill the heavens. It's the understatement of the whole creation, isn't it? When the writer here, Moses, says, likely Moses, says kind of, you know, and, and God created the stars. Uh, billions of stars, just and God created the stars. So sun, moon, and stars fill the heavens, fish and birds, millions of varieties fill the seas and the skies. Every living creature fills the land and the crown jewel, the crown jewel of all of it, Adam and Eve, man and woman, all humanity to come, made in the glorious image of the God who speaks, and it is so. Look with me at verse 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and over the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Every human being gloriously made, gloriously created in the image of God. Men, women, young and old, with every color, hair, eyes, skin, speaking every language, doing every kind of work, enjoying every kind of hobby, all gloriously made in the image of God. The God who speaks, and it is so. That's whose image you are made in. But, but did you see, the more, that, the more creating work that God does, the better it gets? Did you notice that? It, it, the day, in the first day, God creates light. And then in verse 4, God saw that it was good. We, we saw that just earlier. And then at the end of each day, day 3, God saw that it was good. Day 4, God saw that it was good. Um, Day five, God saw that it was good. We get the picture. But then we get to day six. And will you read verse 31 with me? God saw that all, oh, God saw all that he had made, and it was ketepai. It was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. But because the, 
the completed, the completed creation, with, with humanity, with humanity kind of in God's image as the crown jewel. It, it isn't just good. It isn't just good. It's very good. It, it's so good. It's so complete, so beautiful, so amazing that creation is done and God rests. Did you see that? Genesis 2, starting at verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creation he had done. He said, and this very good creation completed, done, with humans made in God's image, that these humans are then where the rest of chapter 2 kind of zooms in on. Uh, it's like a camera zooming in, kind of, we've had this wide view over all creation, and now we zoom in on, a, on, the, on the most critical detail, the center of the image. And as we zoom, we see the beautiful detail of the Garden of Eden, beautiful tasty, bountiful provision everywhere. We see Adam created in God's image, involved in the work of the garden. He's naming animals, kind of extending God's rule in creation. We see the problem that Adam is alone. The wonderful provision of Eve. A provision, did you know, it's so great that Adam breaks out in song. Isn't that nice? The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. We see that man and that woman joined together in marriage. They complete each other. Adam and Eve, man and wife, the beginning of humanity. Vulnerable and intimate. There's no shame. There's nothing broken. There's nothing flawed. There's nothing to hide. There's nothing to despise. Verse 25, chapter 2, verse 25, read it with me. Adam and Eve, sorry, Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. There's lots more that we could, that we could explore as we kind of do the whistle-stop tour of Genesis 1 and 2. But do you see what's happening here? There's God creates all things. And as he does it, he reveals some of who he is, doesn't he? The God who creates, who names, who cares for, provides for, directs, sustains, loves, cherishes. That's our God. But, but if we want to dig further into this part of God's Word and explore this pattern more, we have to ask a few questions about what Genesis 1 and 2 are. Because Genesis 1 and 2 seem far more concerned with the who, can I say, the who of creation than the how. And if we look carefully, we'll see that it's intentionally crafted, beautifully crafted to move us, to grab us. You see, these are not just details to commit to the minutia, to commit to, mem to memory, or processes to kind of understand and explore. This isn't a science textbook, do you notice? This, this is power to draw us to wonder, majesty to cause us to worship. Even the first verse, there are seven words, seven words in the original uh, Hebrew. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim wa et haeret. You following? Uh, seven words, like. We turn it into ten in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. But it's seven in the Hebrew, the number of perfection, of completion, intentionally chosen. And then the, the poetic composition of the rest of Genesis 1. Did you note your Bibles are kind of indented after each day to mark the section of the poetry as God speaks, as he sees his intimate concern with what is going on in his creation. The psalmists, they pick this up. They, they pick up these ideas, they express the wonder and worship. Psalm 95, verse 3. For the Lord 
is the great God, the great King above all gods. Verse 6, come, let us bow down and worship. That's the right response, isn't it? Come, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. This is our song, isn't it? Our prayer. If only we've seen the great God of our creation. Well, what that means then is that the question about what the word day means, you know, is it six 24-hour periods? Is it six epochs in time? Is it six symbolic poetic breaks? What it means is that question, and we'll get there, not now, not today, but when we kind of journey more slowly through Genesis one day in the future, but, but that question, it actually kind of sits in the background, doesn't it? Because of the purpose of how this is written. And so as we kind of keep exploring this text together, I want to highlight five things that Genesis is showing us about our great God and about the pattern of his creation. The first is this. It's all about God. It's all about God because his fingerprints are all over creation. And we've already seen this because the central figure is God. He's mentioned 39 times in chapters 1 and 2. 11 of those, it's not just God, but the Lord God. But his fingerprints are everywhere. Just like if I'm crafting an ornament from glass, then my fingerprints would be everywhere. You'd see them. Look at verse 26 with me. There's a slide here that I'm trying to show you how it all looks uh, when you start seeing where God is. There's two verses. Then God said, let us, that's God, make mankind in our, that's God's image, in our, God's likeness. So God created mankind in his, God's own image, in the image of God that, you know, he, God, created the male and female. He, God, created them. God is everywhere here. He is the one doing everything. That's our first thing. It's all about God. The second thing, the physical creation is good. You see, so often there's kind of subtle messages, subtle messages within our kind of Western ideas that if you kind of dig it down a little bit, you see the bedrock that they sit on. And they, they sit on this Greek philosophical idea that shaped it for hundreds of years. Yeah, Plato, uh, Plato talked about the form or the idea. That was the perfect thing. And it wasn't physical. The physical thing that you could touch and hold, that concrete reality, that was just a kind of shadow, a poor representation, flawed. So form, the idea, that, that, that perfect spirit thing, that's, that's the good thing. And the physical draws its existence from it, but is broken. That's why in the movies, you know, you know those old cartoons where kind of, you know, someone dies and then the little blue or green little light floats off the spirit or the soul, sort of freed, from, freed from the confines of the prison of the physical but not here, not in Genesis 1 and 2, because here, the powerful God who made it, is that this God, by the way, he's spirit, do you realize? And God who is spirit declares what he has made, this physical earth, this physical creation is good. And when it's completed with humanity, the little cherry on top, it's very good. That's our second point. Creation is good. Thirdly, Creation is ordered. We've touched on this as well. The six days that we've looked, the structure that provides order to creation, but then even within that structure and order, they emerge out of chaos. Spaces are separated, the heavens and the earth, uh, the, the waters are gathered. These spaces are then filled. Then there's the predictable at the end of each day, and there was evening and there was morning. But did you notice the echo? As we looked at plants, fish, birds, living creatures, each one is made according to their kinds. This order that God has built into creation, 
or the order is God rules all that he has made. Well, the order, the structure is humanity, each one of us made in his majestic image. Now, this being made in God's image in order to rule, Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule. That's not, that's not license to exploit, I hope you see. But to rule, to extend, to work in creation like God did. With the same care as if we had crafted it carefully. Named it. This order. This is, this is what makes our creation something that we study. It's what means that when we observe something in an environment, we can actually assume that the same thing in the same environment will react the same way. This is the kind of the foundation that the scientific that scientific exploration is is sits on. This order within our universe. That's our third thing. Creation is ordered. Fourth, uh, humanity is the crown jewel of creation. We can see this in the attention that God gives within this, this creation story of Adam and Eve, can't we? Man and woman. Chapter 2 zooms right in on Adam and Eve, telling us more about Adam and Eve than any other aspect of creation. It, it tells us of the relationship that humans have with our God and Creator, the, the care that God finds, you know, the care is God finds a helper suitable for Adam, crafting Eve out of Adam's own rib. We see it in the image that Adam and Eve bear, that made in the, the image of their majestic God and Creator. We can see it in the, the way humanity completes creation. And in its complete end that the that the creation isn't just good, but it's very good. That's our fourth thing. Humanity is the crown jewel of creation. Is that how you see yourself? The crown jewel of everything that has been made. How good is that? Finally, rest. Rest is the purpose of creation, this rest being in relationship with God. This is, uh, this is of course, how the creation account ends uh, in Genesis 2, 1 and 2. Shall we read those together again? Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. This rest... Did you note what it didn't say? By the seventh day, God had finished all the work that he'd been doing and he was exhausted. His creation seems effortless and yet at the end of it, it's done. And so he steps aside from his work of creating and he rests. But it's not like what I do when I've had a big day, too tired to do anything constructive and so I kind of, you know, out comes the phone and you're kind of scrolling endlessly through YouTube cooking videos. You may have some other little habit. But this isn't God. Rest here. Rest is because creation's finished. All that work is done. God continues to work. He's sustaining all things. But this rest, it's relational rest. God in perfect relationship with all of his creation. In a way that we can't even begin to comprehend, I don't think. Because everything we know is so broken, so flawed, isn't it? You see, in Genesis 3, um, we'll pick up more of this next week. In Genesis 3, it just seems normal for God to be taking a casual stroll in the cool of the garden with Adam and Eve, with humanity. Genesis 3 verse 8. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. This beautiful image of relationships taking a stroll together. It seems so out of reach. Cast your minds back. Like, like getting on a plane in the middle of COVID. Or like seeing loved ones in the middle of the lockdowns we had. 
out of reach. But that rest, this rest of Genesis 2, it's still available in Jesus. You, you might have picked this up when we were working our way through Hebrews earlier this year. Hebrews 4 verse 1, Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands. This is the purpose of creation, and it's still available. Rest is the purpose. That's our final thing. And so as we wrap up, we've seen something of a pattern, and we'll track this pattern over the next eight weeks. It's a pattern where there's kind of these four different components to it. God's people, God's place, God's rule, and God's rescue. So as we kind of get to come towards the end of each section of our eight-week series, we're going to ask the question, of what, where are we up to with God's people, God's place, God's rule, and God's rescue? Well, in Genesis 1 and 2, God's people, they're Adam and Eve, aren't they? God's place, this beautiful, bountiful Garden of Eden. God's rule. Well, that's God's rule under which Adam and Eve flourish and extend his rule. I think the task is to take this Garden of Eden and extend it over the whole face of the earth. And God's rescue, well, it's not needed. God and his people in perfect relationship. But there's also a pattern here for this relationship, a thing to long for, for that rest and relationship to be restored. So our final question is, will we respond in worship and rest? And perhaps it is to join with the psalmists, one of which we saw earlier. As they see the majestic work of God's creation. They, they put words together to give you know, words for our souls to sing. In Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Psalm 95, for the Lord is a great God, the great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. Psalm 150, let everything that has breath praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But there's, there's something else before we sing and join some of these words in response. There's something else and it's what God was doing. What God was doing before he said those four words, let there be light. And that is he was choosing. He was choosing to rescue people. Ephesians 1, it's on the screen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Isn't that amazing? If you trust Jesus, know that you were chosen before that first light beam was formed, before water was separated and gathered, before seeds sprouted from the ground, before fish swam and birds flew, before living creatures roamed the earth, before humanity was given the majestic image of God, our creator. Before all that, God was choosing to rescue you. And if today you don't yet trust in Jesus, perhaps today, as we've looked at this pattern together for God's creation, as you watched it come into being, as you see his care, his concern, his love. Perhaps you're here today hearing about Jesus, choosing people before the beginning of time because before the beginning of time, maybe he was choosing you. And if that's you, I'd love to hear your story. Shall we pray? Let's pray together. Father, we give you great thanks. We praise you, we worship you because of what you've done. 
what you've made, the beauty, the complexity, the, the spaces and what you've filled them with. We, we praise you because through it all you've revealed some of who you are. This infinite, powerful, amazing God. And so, Father, would you, would you draw us into lives of worship? But you, would you also give us a great desire to be at rest with you, to be in relationship with you in, this, in the way that it's painted here on the pages of Genesis 2 as, in Genesis 3 as you walk with your creation, in your creation with your people. Help us yearn for that. In Jesus' name.